17, 2018 South African Police Service crime statistics. It's uh, an event that happens once a year when the Minister of Police uh, is expected to report the financial year of crime statistics to the Police Portfolio Committee in Parliament. And it is the time when we really get to take stock of what has been reported in relation to different kinds of crime categories. This year, we, the, the, it was released this morning in Parliament, and the interesting difference that I first noticed was how very quickly the Minister and the National Commissioner started to talk about the murder rate. And that was the crime statistic that showed the biggest increase. It is our most reliable crime statistic. It is generally considered the most accurate indicator of violence in South Africa because most bodies that are, are killed or people who have died as a result of murder are reported to the police. So that tells us uh, if that figure goes up, that we have a problem with violence. And this year we saw an increase of 1,320 more murders than was the case last year. So we have a total of 20, over 20,000, uh, about 20,300 murders in South Africa last year, and that represents the biggest single annual increase in murder since the advent of democracy in 1994. So it really is a red flag, it is a wake-up call. Murder, fortunately, had declined by 54% during the first 18 years of democracy, but we started to see the increases in 2011-12, and now this is the sixth consecutive year in which murder has increased. So that the murder rate, the rate of murders per 100,000 cumulatively over the last six years has increased by about 17%. Um, turning to about, I think it's about 56 murders every day on average. So we clearly have a problem with violence. And what was more disturbing about the crime stats this year is that the murder rate increases for women and children were higher than the total average murder increase. So the average increase was 6.9% compared to last year, but for girls under the age of 18, it was 10%. For women, it was 11%. And for boys under the age of 18, it was 20% increase. So we are seeing a situation in which our vulnerable children and women are being experiencing much greater levels of murders and violence than was the case previously. And that is uh, to be of, uh, of severe concern. Now, what was interesting about the crime stats in this, in the sense is that typically murders are as a result of assaults or robberies. And there are a variety of other intergroup dynamics that can play a role in murder. But the crime stats for assault show reductions, that the assault rates have been going down. And similarly, although we've seen big increases in aggravated robbery, which are armed robberies, over the last six years, we see them stabilizing. So very slight overall decrease of 1.8% um, in the aggra total aggravated robbery category, which has got subcategories. So it suggests uh, either that there's a, a, a declining level of reports, that people are not reporting as many street robberies or not reporting as many house robberies as before, or that people who are victims of assaults are not reporting this to the police for various reasons, because it is unusual to see the factors that contribute to rob uh, murders taking place going down while the actual murder figure is going up. But this is not unique uh, to crime statistics they do not necessarily capture all, uh, level, all incidents of crime in South Africa. But I think what I wanted to say about uh, the approach which was uh, to be welcomed is that the police minister and the national commissioner, basically most of their briefing to the portfolio committee was on murder. And over the last 10 years, what we have seen is a lot of attempts to try and distract from these increases that we've been seeing since 2011-12 by previous ministers and previous national commissioners who would cluster total crime together, say the seven big categories that make up all violent crime, uh, and which they call total contact crime, and then saying, well, that's going down, and leave murder and robbery, which were going up to the very end, and not say much about them. Uh, this time we really saw a willingness by the police ministers to say, this is a big challenge and all other crime stats don't mean anything if we can't get the murder rate down. 
And so that was to be welcomed. And I think that, we, that their willingness to say that they need to develop and strengthen partnerships from, uh, with organization and groups outside of the police, that they provided a lot more data on murder and who is being murdered in what circumstances this year than ever before, certainly demonstrates a new approach, a willingness not to bury their heads in the sand and say nothing's wrong and hope it'll just get better in the soon, but to really start looking at the evidence before them, demonstrate that they're aware of the evidence and that they're willing to do things differently to, to reduce it. So from the position of the Institute for Security Studies, this was a very welcome shift. It's a new approach, and I think it is a reason to give us hope that hopefully uh, if we use the resources available to us, we will make a difference. But it can't just be about policing. Um, I think there's a lot the police can do, certainly to bring down gang violence, to bring down murders that are associated with vigilantism, uh, to bring down murders associated with robberies, they can do this. And this afternoon we had a seminar on using police data. So if they are able to allocate or identify particularly geographical areas where murders are taking place, and we know, for example, that 13% uh, or 149, 48 police precincts record 50% of the murders, and in fact, over 40% of the current increases occur in less than in, in 30 police station precincts in the country, it means that the police don't need to put their resources everywhere. The police are not policing 57 million people living in South Africa, they need to identify those few thousand offenders that are often uh, re repeatedly causing uh, offenses, repeatedly committing robberies, repeatedly getting involved in fights, identify those people and police those people. And if they can get those crimes down, people will feel safer and it'll be then easier to get partnerships and to get communities to play a role in reducing other crimes such as property crime. Um, and that kind of thing. So we need to see a very strategic approach in the police to really focus on the crimes they can reduce and using their resources more efficiently. But it's not, as I said before, a police concern alone. The increase in the murders of children and women who are the primary caregivers of children in South Africa is a very serious concern because the violence that children experience in their homes now will manifest in high levels of violence 10 years from now. We know from various research that children who are exposed to violence in the home or in their communities suffer trauma, they're more likely to drop out of school, battle to concentrate and do well at school so they do not get as good jobs, they battle to secure jobs, to keep jobs, they're more likely to suffer mental health consequences, depression, and abuse drugs and alcohol. And then almost four times more likely to either fall victim to violence late in life or perpetrate violence, particularly if they are males. So if we don't address the violence against women and children in our society now as a matter of urgency, we're not going to see sustainable reductions in violence from now on, and we will continue to be having problems with uh, high levels of assaults, murders, and rapes, and robberies. So to put this into context, had we really invested in violence prevention, evidence-based interventions, 10 or 20 years ago, we might have seen this decline in murders that was happening until 2012 continue. And the police minister himself said they worked out that if that trend had continued, we would be having a situation where the number of murders reported last year would be less than 50% what it is now, more around 9,000. 9, but unfortunately, that is not the case. And so I think in many ways, we now need to start doing things differently. Uh, there is evidence about what works. It's not easy but we need to put more money into it. We need to make sure that we don't just see the police and the criminal justice system as the only solution to a violence problem that we are currently facing. Uh, we now have new political leadership in the police and in government. We are unlikely to see big shifts in the next year, at least until elections. Uh, it's very difficult to get new programs off the ground on that, but it is heartening that today the people responsible for the police, at least, have recognized that we are facing a serious challenge. And I do hope that this leads to fundamental changes in the way that, for example, data is shared. The police, as we saw this afternoon in our seminar, have a remarkable amount of evidence and information about murders, for example. So they know where people are murdered, what time of the day, what day of the week, details about the victim, the circumstances in which they were murdered, specific locations in which the murder took place, and that information they use to assist them in their investigations.
But that information would also be incredibly useful to know where exactly we need to have violence prevention interventions and what kind of violence interventions. If we know the profile of the offenders and the victims, and we know the factors that are contributing to high levels of violence, alcohol abuse, we know the status of the people committing these murders, whether they were in school or they've been involved in other kinds of tertiary activities, but those aren't available in those areas. That, that is what violence prevention is about. It's meaningful, measurable, evidence-based interventions that address the factors that result in uh, people committing violence in the first place. And after well over 20 years of democracy, we need to start realizing that we have to look at this problem anew from a new perspective, and we can't leave it to the police alone. One day I hope to see a situation that rather than an annual release of the police crime data, we have an annual release of government information on public safety in South Africa, and that we have more than one minister sitting at the table, but that we have a number of ministers, not only the Minister of Justice, Correctional Services, Home Affairs, but Social Development, Education, Health, Economic Affairs and Development, to explain how their ministries have in the last year played a meaningful and measurable role in providing services to people in South Africa so that the factors that cause people to be violent and harm each other are being meaningfully addressed. If we can achieve that vision in the near future, we will be living in a very different and far more prosperous country. So on that closing note, I will take questions, um, and thank you for listening to the briefing to, so far. Are there any questions? If there aren't any questions, then I'd be very happy to end the briefing. Um, but if there are pressing questions, then I'm happy to respond to them, or we can speak later. There's a question there and a question there. We're just giving marks to the, the questions. Hi, my name is Andrew Fall from the Institute for Security Studies. Thanks very much, Garrett. That was very insightful. Um, I think many South Africans, uh, we, we all feel anxious about um, the potential for being a victim of crime. And many of us first think we need more police. We're hearing increasing calls, particularly in the Western Cape, for the army to be deployed. Um, I think the ISS quite, stands quite strongly against the deployment of the army and perhaps not necessarily needing more police. Could you um, summarize your perspective on these matters? If we look at the last uh, period since 2011-12 when the murder rate started increasing and robbery rates went up by 40%, uh, the police budget went up by over 50%. So we have now reached a situation where in the next medium term expenditure framework, the next three years, there is not going to be more money for the police. They simply do not, are not able to have the twice above inflation increases that they enjoyed for most of the last two decades. Um, the cost of the personnel budget in the South African police service is already well over 70%. They also need to have vehicles, training, police stations, and equipment. Uh, so that personnel budget can't increase. So whether we like it or not, um, it's not a question about saying we don't want more police. Obviously, it's good to have more resources, but we simply can't afford it. And there is so much room for efficiency to improvements. The previous 10 years, due to the leadership destabilization, the National Development Plan called it a serial crisis of top management in the South African Police Service, where we went through a range of about five or six different people occupying the position of national commissioner, and each time a new national commissioner arrived, um, there'd be restructuring at the top and new people would be in new positions. Um, that fundamentally weakened the various systems for ensuring that there was proper training, proper accountability, proper um, um, resourcing across the, 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 the police agency. So in that period where we saw this 50% increase in the budget, we've seen declines in various performance indicators such as detection rates for murder, detection rates for uh, robbery. Uh, the number of roadblocks being held, the number of patrols, the number of school visits, everything was starting to decline. Crime intelligence was in a state of crisis because of political interference where it all but dried up at a national level and you had pockets of crime intelligence operating very well at quite local levels, but on their own without being able to know how gangs or organized crime syndicates working across the country. Um, and a lot of abuse of crime intelligence resources where it has been directed away from tackling crime and being focused onto activists who are organizing public protests, for example. There's a lot of evidence of that. 
Detectives were not getting the kinds of support and resources they need to investigate and make sure that evidence is brought before the court. So uh, in the most recent National Prosecuting Authority annual report, people don't realize that 90%, almost 90% of the cases allocated to the National Prosecuting Authority by the detectives were literally not acted on and did not result in the prosecution. 55% were simply, uh, there was a decision not to prosecute. And that information wasn't going back to the victims. So what would happen is the victims would just know their case was investigated and the case had gone, the docket had gone to the, pub, the public prosecutor and they never hear anything about it again. So we saw a decline in public trust in the police and the prosecuting authority. So simply put, we now need to work on improving efficiencies and improving public trust. If the police can basically demonstrate that they have a clear strategy to go after the most serious crimes as I mentioned earlier, in the right places, using the right resources and partnerships. They can demonstrate that they're doing that so that they can say to people, look, in this area we're having an incredibly high problem with street robberies, house robberies, and murders. Um, we will get to the cell phone theft as soon as we can, but we can't make promises. Communicate, manage expectations, but demonstrate that the resources are being used to take serious crime. People will understand that, I think, and they'll realize that we can listen to the police. So the, the first key priority for us would be the police to, to build public credibility by being transparent. When they get information of wrongdoing, act on that information, be fair but be thorough and quick. And so that the police themselves know where they stand, communities see that the, public, uh, that the police are a service and you start improving public trust. So the police get more support, get more information, can target their resources more effectively. Um, that would go far, much more towards reducing crime and violence than just hiring more cops. Just to show you that, that between 2002 and 2012, the size of the South African Police Service grew by over 68,000 posts. And after that growth in 68,000 posts, the murder rate and the aggravated robbery rate rocketed. So the answer, unfortunately, even if we could afford it, is not more police officers. It's building public trust, and be more efficient with the resources that we have. The army in democracy should never be deployed for domestic purposes. And when you speak to many police officers or people working in, in policing or internationally in democracies are quite horrified that we even consider this. The army are not trained uh, to deal with policing in a domestic situation. The army are trained to search and destroy and they carry weapons that are designed only to kill. The police are trained to engage communities, solve problems, enforce the law, and uphold people's rights. Uh, and so while it might look good for optics and politics to have soldiers roaming around our streets and townships with automatic weapons, we know from over 20 years of deploying the army, because we do it every year over Christmas, that it does nothing to sustainably improve safety in those communities. For a very short period of time during the deployment, there will be a, usually some kind of dampening of crime effect. But once the army's out of there, the factors that are causing crime in the first place kick right back in again, and those communities are left um, where they were before. So we don't want people to think that if we do this, deploying the military, we don't, that that's enough. Um, ideally, we take the hard yards, we look at the solutions, and we do what it takes to implement it, but we communicate it as much as possible so that no one ever thinks that the army is a solution. Thank you for that. A, the long answer to your question. Um, you serve there, I think. Oh, okay. Cindy Lakhani, I have a simple question like um, Stats are say released, um, it's unemployment figures early this year, right? And we're seeing the current crime rates. And would you say there's a direct correlation towards how the economy is performing? And the, the, crime, the crime trends we're seeing. I think that certainly our economic situation, particularly our high levels of poverty and unemployment, do play a push factor. It's not the only factor. Um, people are not simply committing crime because they are poor. Uh, but certainly when you look at a lot of property crimes, and some of the research into that does suggest that it's much younger, the population groups, young males who are committing particularly the property crime are in the category of the highest unemployment rates. Um, and when you have a situation in which you simply have no other options, it's 
not and, and such high level of inequality. I think that's one of the things that people don't always understand. It's not the poverty or the unemployment. It's the fact that there's incredible proximity of such poverty and employment to massive wealth. Um, and when that, when people simply do not have an option of getting a job, getting being gainfully employed, but people are living in mansions just across the road, and driving very wealthy cars, and wearing jewelry that costs more than money than they'll see in a year. Um, it's very easy legitim to, be le to, to, to give reasons to why, well, if we, I'm not talking about violent crime, I'm talking about property crime, to steal that, to take that, because I can't, have, I don't have a cho choice if I need to fa feed a family. So it's not about justifying the violent crime, but I think we are certainly not going to reduce uh, much of our property crime and our violence, in, in fact, unless we get the economy growing, unless we get uh, improvements on our employment and reduce inequality. Um, so it's not a simple correlation because there are other countries that have uh, worse economies than ours and they don't have nearly the same kinds of murder rates that we have. But I think we do need to understand that um, we can't, that's one of the reasons we can't just police this down. And ideally that we have enough, the economic growth will also mean that the government has more resources to make sure people can stay in school longer. But there are also things we can do now. I mean, I think um, one of the, for me, a bugbear is this idea that the metric rate, pass rate has to be so high, that we must make sure that 70% of people who write metric pass. And what that means is that we force half a million people out of schools um, who start grade one so that we can have nice looking statistics. I would be much more comfortable with a 20% metric pass rate, but a 90% uh, of 18 and 70 year olds still in metric where even if they're not going to pass, they are in a structured environment where they can be looked after, engaged with, help solve conflicts, uh, train them in cognitive or relationship behavior, give them options to play soccer or sport. Um, so in many ways, there's lots we can do with the resources we have, which I think we're not doing, and we need to think creatively about that. So that, that's also quite a long answer to your, <laughs> your question. Historically, the, the, the murder kind of um, trends in the Eastern Cape in particular would be accounted for by 95% being basically un, non premeditated type of murder, kind of linked to social situations that, that went wrong and people not being able to manage conflict and that sort of thing. And there, the, the, the profile in the Eastern Cape in particular, and I think Western Cape as well, it's largely younger males killing younger males with about, I think, a 15% gender woman basically being the, the victims. Um, recently we've seen changes in, 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 in the murder. Mark Shaw's ported, pointed out that the in, slight increases in political um, assassinations being a, a phenomenon and then stuff that we've been doing in the Eastern Cape, mob justice is also a hidden murder phenomenon within the murder rate which um, increasingly is also, and we're doing some more work on that at the moment, which is showing that there's an increase in that as well. If you look at the, the, the trends that are coming out now, how can we explain that? Uh, is, is it linked to the, the fact that um, violence and, and gangsterism, for example, is, is spreading into a lot of more schools, which is happening in the Eastern Cape? We're seeing a lot of rural schools now with high levels of violence and, and, and gangsterism um, phenomena happening there. Is it that? Or what are the kind of... Um, factors that you could maybe start putting together to assemble a, a kind of an, an understanding of, of this, this almost, uh, it's, a, it's a shift in, 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 in qualitatively in, in how murder is happening. That's a very good question uh, and I actually don't have the answers because we don't know the answers at this point in time. We can only speculate and hypothesize. Uh, for the first time in this crime report, they gave a breakdown in what they called multiple cause violence, so, or group violence. So you saw how many vigilante deaths there were, and that was remarkably high, it was over 800. How many gang-related violence there were, and that was also remarkably by over 900. But we don't have that historical data to see if last year there were only 500 vigilante deaths and now there's 800, uh, that could be one explanation. So I think what we would really be calling for is, it's very difficult to know what to do if you don't know what's causing the problem. Um, on the superficial level, I've mentioned that the, the two kind of core reasons the police have traditionally given for increased murders is assaults and robberies. But now we don't even know if assaults actually going down. 
Victims of Crime Survey have shown a 27% uh, reduction in reporting rates for assault between 2013 and 2016. Um, so that could just be the fact that fewer people are reporting assaults because the police don't have the capacity to deal with it. It's not seen as a very serious crime. Um, or it could be that there is a reduction in assaults and something else is causing this increase uh, in the murders. So we, and that is another what I would call sort of low hanging fruit. Um, the police have this amazing data sets. They've got an incredible amount of information about all the murders. Uh, historically, the different um, organizations such as the Medical Research Center does research on murders. We've got a lot of rich data from the state pathologists. Um, we've got a lot of data from the emergency services in different communities. And really, I think it's about time that we um, set up structures. Ideally, it could be led by the police or um, uh, similar, maybe the Department of Justice. Set up structures, bring all the people, the different research capacities, their information. Um, and this is actually a model that was used before they started developing in excess of 200 violence prevention initiatives in Bogota, Colombia. They just saw murder, I mean, that's, in 1994, murder rate was 80 murders per 100,000, but 2004, 10 years later, it was 18 per 100,000. And the first thing they did was say, well, let's get all the data we can. They had the prosecutor's authority in, the Justice Department, universities, their various health departments, and they actually pulled all this data together, and they got people to look at it, interpret it, and analyze it. And then where there were gaps, they had targeted focus research investigations into that. And then they would know that in this part of Bogota, the key contributing factor to murder, for example, is alcohol and people drinking drunk and getting into fights. Um, and then came up with a very innovative program. So uh, one that caused a lot of controversy but had the empirical basis to show that it was effective was teach your child how to drink alcohol course. And the parents were outraged, but actually what it was intended to do was to, with quite with teen, people just becoming teenagers, um, show them the effects of alcohol, take them to places where people were drunk, show them video footage, take them to the mortuary, show them what the consequence of alcohol can be, practically. Um, and then just speak about in a very non-judgmental way, because alcohol was also a very normative thing. People didn't think it was a problem. But it actually had a huge impact. Um, the, uh, the alcohol abuse rates amongst the kids on the, who went and attended those programs was far lower years later than it was for kids who hadn't been in that program. So, but they wouldn't have known that if they hadn't have done that kind of research. And right now we're sitting with all this data in different places, um, in different institutions, and everybody is absolutely terrified of sharing it with each other because it's seen as their data and they need to do something with it. And, but in many ways, um, if it's in the public interest, uh, it's about time we start looking at this differently. So this is something that the police could take a lead in. And I mean, a simple thing like basically the first day of every month, putting the monthly crime statistics in the client service center with the same crime statistics for a year ago, will quickly alert the community to house burglaries going up or street robberies might be going up. And then immediately think, well, we can, let's, who, who in the community can we work with, have an intervention, and the next month they'll see if that intervention's working. But if you're releasing the, st st uh, the statistics as we're doing now uh, for station levels once a year, six months after they've been gathered, you simply can't do that. We're looking at historical data now. So there are so many things we could actually practically do that would make a huge difference. And that's why I think um, the opportunity of new leadership politically and in the police hopefully will lead to new, th new ways of thinking and new partnerships and new innovations. Because we don't need, I don't really think um, South Africa needs more money I just think we need to think differently and do things differently because what we have been doing hasn't worked. And one of the things we need to do what is, is be able to answer those questions. Because right now I can hypothesize, but actually no one really knows what the answer to that question is. And if we don't know what the answer to the question is, we don't know how to respond to it. Thank you. Okay, uh, it is now just after quarter to five. We did um, hire this equipment until this time. <laughs> so I will have to end the briefing now. But thank you very much to the online audience for watching and listening. Thank you very much to you in the audience for asking your questions and, and being here today. We hope that you keep uh, follow the ISS, visit our website or on social media, and we hope to see you at our future events. Thank you very much.